going to start by going through a few scenarios from actual families that um, we've talked with in Washington State about how they are affected by policies and practices in our public schools in Washington State that serve to push kids away from school, away from a graduation date, and away from um, a lot of chances and opportunities that we all take for granted, I think, in life. A few um, practices that we've focused, focused on at the ACLU of Washington, trying to figure out where are these points where kids are being pushed out of the system. As a civil rights organization, we're concerned about it from a racial justice end, and we're concerned about it from a sense of due process. Is there a fair analysis of what happened and what the appropriate response is when kids are being pushed out and effectively denied an education? So let me start with an example from a sort of rural urban school district in Washington State. There was a student who called us. He had been suspended for possession of drugs. He was given a 45-day suspension. It was his first offense, um, but drug possession is considered uh, an extreme violation of the rules at the district, so his first offense was 45-day suspension. Um, he attends a school that's predominantly white still. Um, he is um, a black student. He denied ever possessing or using drugs, and in fact, the day that they alleged that he possessed them, they searched him for drugs, twice. They came up empty, twice. They nonetheless took the word of another student and said, you're suspended. They told him on the day that he was suspended, he had to go home and could not come back to school until the suspension was over. In fact, that's not true. When a student is subjected to long-term suspension in Washington State, they have a right to a hearing before the suspension is imposed. He didn't know that, and so he left school grounds, and he sought help. He asked for information about how to ask for a hearing. He eventually got a hearing. It was about a month later. At the hearing, he convinced the hearing officer that he should be able to go back to school right away, and he convinced the hearing officer that they should now give him his homework for those days that he missed so that he could catch up from 30 days. So here's another example from a relatively rural school district out in eastern Washington. We got a, a call from a family with a student, another young man, was expelled on an emergency basis, emergency expulsion, for gang activity. He was accused of gang membership based on photos that were discovered on a friend's MySpace page that had been taken one year prior to the emergency expulsion and posted at some unknown date but discovered that day. Um, they were alleged gang association photographs where they showed kids holding up peace signs and wearing bandanas. So he was emergency expelled. Now under the laws of the state, emergency expulsions are supposed to be limited to where there is an imminent threat the safety of the school or other students. Um, this was not an emergency, but nonetheless th that was imposed. His mother, um, I think, surprised the school and immediately asked for a hearing. It took several days for them to get the hearing on. At the hearing, he was successful in getting it reduced to a 16-day long-term suspension and eventually went back. This student, actually, his mother is a corrections officer. She receives regular training on gang symbols and what it means to be in a gang and how dangerous it is. And I'll tell you, she would brook no dissent from her son when she says, you are not going to be in a gang. Right? So she watches what kind of bandanas he carries. She watches what kind of things he wears to show or indicate or not whether or not he's in a gang. So they were really troubled by this allegation of gang um, affiliation. Uh, just one more story to sort of put another perspective on the way these things play out. We got a call um, from a family where a child was expelled for fighting. Um, actually, this child um, had gotten into fights repeatedly, and the school said, look, you know, next time we really, we're going to have to expel you. You can't fight in school. So after the last warning, he got in another fight, and he was expelled. Well, the history of this student matters again. So the student is um, African American, and each time he got in a fight, it was because someone was calling him the N-word, and he really didn't appreciate that, and his response was, which his parents tried to counsel on him on, was violent reaction. He would respond by fighting to them. Well, ultimately, the, the N-word didn't stop, but the, the student was expelled. His option um, from the school is an alternative school. Um, it offers three days a week of school, and it's a 
30 minute drive away and there's no public transportation there. So the family's now working on other options, right? Because you go from five days to three days of school a week, um, that doesn't help you move towards academic success or graduation. It probably doesn't help you resolve issues about how to deal with your peers even when you are being harassed. Um, and the school district still has the issue of um, a racially hostile environment potentially in the school with racial slurs being flung around like that. So these are some real examples of the school to prison pipeline currently at play in Washington State Public Schools. When we look at the statistics about um, the, the differences in African American, Native American, Latino student success on the Wassel, can we really be surprised that they're not doing as well on tests if they've been excluded from school at much higher rates and for much longer periods of time? Um, we don't have all the data and statistics to put that together because actually Washington State schools are sort of hit or miss on collection of discipline data and truancy data and whatnot. But um, you know, we really think there's a common sense connection between the amount of time that you're excluded from your classroom, that you're effectively denied an education, and your ability to succeed academically. There's also a connection to your ability to succeed and whether the ac educational programming and the atmosphere in school is equitable, whether it's fair, whether it's free from discrimination. So um, that sort of paints a picture that I think is, is a little bit gloomy. Um, I'm happy to say that there are some success stories in there, and I think that they have been um, one, when um, people who are being affected are aware that they do have rights in the situation. So one of the things that the ACLU of Washington has tried to do is develop materials um, that can be shared with the community, that can be shared with families and um, students that talk about what their rights are. Um, some of the changes in terms of combating or dismantling, as we say, the school to prison pipeline, happen in individual cases. They happen as a student steps up and says, it's not okay for you to suspend me for 45 days on an allegation that's not true. And by the way, during the term of the suspension, it's not okay to completely de deprive me of any educational programming. In, um, I haven't talked a lot about police in schools, but we have worked also um, with communities to try to change policies and set up procedures so that um, before a student is interrogated by a police officer at school, for a potential rule violation that also <coughs> turned into a, a charge in the juvenile court that the parents ought to be called and ought to be there. So that a 12-year-old is not in a closed room with a, an SRO, a school resource officer, who's a police officer working in the school, with the dean of students <coughs> and with the principal being told that he needs to confess because things are going to go easier that way. Um, and that they'll call his parents once he's told the truth. Um, and so we do have work to do in terms of making sure that our schools are equitable, making sure that when um, teaching and administrative professionals are confronted with these issues, that they have the tools to deal with them. That means um, in the programs where you're learning to be a teacher, um, in the continuing professional development, that you get the skills and the tools to deal with this so that discipline becomes um, really a part of the educational process and not a way to exclude students from the educational process unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, so I, I want to wrap it up there. I just want to say the school to prison pipeline unfortunately is that's what we, you know it's been termed that it does exist in Washington State. There are efforts underway to correct it. It's never a quick fix. I think it involves sort of a shift in thinking. Um, our students um, who misbehave a threat to the educational process or are they students who um, could benefit from further education through the disciplinary process. Um, when we're dealing with students who are missing school, um, can we look to the background of that? Why are they missing school? Um, is it really going to correct it um, if we give them time in jail? Is, is time spent in jail going to all of a sudden cure whatever issues were going on that um, prompted this student to miss school?